So today I've come to Port Moor, which is a little bay near to Mackold on the north of the island. And if you can see just behind me, I've timed it so that it's coming up to low water. So the tide is um, falling or still going out. So these are the safest times if you want to go and ha have an explore on the beach. So today I've come up to Port Moor because I want to show you what I think is a truly remarkable little animal that lives on our beach. So we're at the top end of the beach and what we're looking for is not very likely to be here. If we look down in the pool here, can you see this seaweed here? Can you remember from our seaweed talk? This is called gutweed and it's an indicator that there's fresh water coming here. So the animal I'm looking for won't particularly like it. So we need to go further down the beach. So I've come further down the beach and as you can see among the gut weed there the bright green weed we've now got quite a lot of this spiral weed so this is an indicator that now we're getting a bit more saline or salty water and i found my first little remarkable animal that i wanted to show you there the camera's just focused on it that red blob there that is a sea anemone, a red beadlet sea anemone. And I found another red beadlet there. In fact, if you look now, can you see the tentacles actually moving on it? Now, it does look so much like a flower. And in fact, the name anemone does derive from the fact that everyone thought they were flowers, but they're not, they're animals. Very simple animals, but animals nonetheless. They don't um, move particularly fast. They can move. They have a, um, pedal disc at the bottom of the column and um, with this they can move very very slowly a bit like a snail would move on its foot so you can see quite clearly here the tentacles out as it's actually in water so it's able to feed and if we look very very carefully you might be able to make out in the middle a little central disc which is actually its mouth they're very very simple creatures they just have um, one tubular body which has one gut inside with the tentacles they'll grab the food and bring it into the mouth and then digest the food inside the stomachs and then when they finished unfortunately they don't have nice table manners out comes their poo the same way that it goes in through the mouth so this is what a sea anemone looks like inside. It really, really is a simple creature. So here we have the tentacles on the outside and right in the middle is the mouth just here. If we follow it down, this is actually its throat and it comes down into the stomach here. And of course, like we were saying, as soon as it's finished digesting its food, its poo has to come back out. You can see they've got this massive columnar body and this varies from species this species so it helps us identify them and right at the bottom is what we call the basal or pedal disc. What I'm going to do with red beadlets is perfectly safe to touch them so I'm just going to put my finger nearby and let you see. Can you see how the tentacles have grabbed me? You see how they're hanging on? Really quite tight and if I pull my finger you can see the whole thing moving. Um, it just feels very very tacky now, all sea anemones do sting, but this one doesn't hurt us. You've, it must, it's very important that you remember it's just the red ones that you can touch. So, why do they do that? Well, inside those tentacles, they've got a very clever firing mechanism. And on the end of it is something very like a harpoon. If you eat crabs and shrimps, it's very, very hard if you're slow moving to actually catch them. So what they do is with their tentacles, they actually fire the harpoon out. It has a toxin in it, and this toxin paralyzes the shrimp or the crab or the fish so that it can't move. And then with the tentacles, it'll pull it in and eat it through its mouth. It sounds a bit grim, but for something that doesn't move, that's a really clever mechanism. So this is a little diagram that shows you the stinging cells within the tentacles on the um, anemone. And you can see there really is like a little harpoon 
that fire out from these cells. Can you see this little tiny little hair here? This is a trigger mechanism that makes a harpoon fire out. So it fire into its prey like a prawn or a shrimp and attach itself in and the toxins will be delivered on this harpoon here. So this is what I wanted you to see. That this is a red beetle anemone. It's not in the water. There's no water there at all. And this is what makes it so successful at living up on quite high on the shore. Now sea anemones have a lot of water in them. If you're out of water, you're likely to lose it through evaporation, and especially on the very sunny days that we have. So very cleverly, can you see? We can't see any of those tentacles at all on that anemone. That's because they've been pulled inside. And if we have a little look, can you see there's a dimple on the top? So it's closed its body right round and pulled its tentacles in to stop that evaporation and losing that moisture. Now, the red ones are safe to touch, like I said. And if you touch them, touch them very, very gently. Because sometimes when they close those tentacles up, they trap a bit of water inside. And if they lose that water, they'll dry out a lot more quickly. But when you touch them, they do feel very, very like jelly. If you see a little trickle of water come out, stop straight away, okay? And if you then touch your finger afterwards, it feels slightly slimy. So they cover themselves with mucus to stop that drying out happening. Very, very clever way to adapt to life on the beach. The other thing to note, can you see just there hiding right in that rock crevice, is another sea anemone. If we look up, we can see the sea is out that way. So if we look back down, you can imagine the tide coming in, following that. Okay, there he is, just there. You can imagine the tide washing over the rocks. Now if you're very soft-bodied like this, you, and you get hit by waves, you could get very easily damaged. So by hiding away in these cracks and crevices, it protects itself. It's a really interesting thing to do, to come down onto a beach and just take a note of where you see the sea anemones. Because they're always away from where the wave action will really knock them off the rocks. Of course, being soft-bodied, they can absorb some of that energy. But obviously, you can see just here the basal plate hanging on. They've only got that to hang on with, so they don't need too much energy. They do need a bit of flow of water over them to help them feed. So often you'll see that they're clustered together in the same sites because it's a really good feeding site. So we have a lovely snake's lock anemone here. You can see that really vivid green colour on the pink tips. And we're looking right down the middle there. And can you see, right in the middle, there's a little hole, which is its mouth. So this is what I really love just about rock pooling because here it looks almost like an underwater water garden. We've got snake flock anemones and we've also got the beautiful pink coralline seaweed. And as we just look all around on this particular rock, you can see it's quite well clustered. The other pink stuff that you can see there is pink encrusting seaweed. Look there, that's another snake's lock and enemy and there you can really see the columnar body and the basal disc on that one. So this very dull looking creature here is another snake's lock and enemy. Now just as you think you managed to ID the anemones, they do come in a huge range of colours. The red beadlets can be a browny colour, they can be a greeny colour. So you really need to know what you're looking at before you touch it there. Did you see it just move then? So this is another snake's lock anemone. I want you to see the snake's lock again because I want to show you if I move the camera up and hopefully it'll keep me focusing. Um, its position in the pool is really quite open. That lovely green colour is caused by an algae that's actually inside its tentacles and it has a symbiotic relationship with the algae. So the algae produces sugars which the sea anemone um, eats 
and the sea anemone looks after the algae because of course it's got those stinging cells. The life cycle of sea anemones is very, very complex and they can actually reproduce themselves in many different ways. Now what look, we're looking at here is actually a tiny little plankton larval form of a sea anemone. So just like other animals, we get sperm and egg mixed together um, in the seawater around the anemones. And this is when we get this larval state um, and they can float around until they become benthic. That means they land on the bottom of the seabed and then establish them themselves as a sea anemone like we um, used to seeing. Now this photograph I um, took when I'd taken some specimens into a school and much to our surprise when we start off with one little sea anemone in our tray all of a sudden there were lots of little ones floating around and this is a picture of them they are literally about one and a half millimeters in diameter. So what they're capable of is budding and producing little um, sea anemones within a cavity inside their bodies, which they then can release later on. This is a photograph of another um, sea anemone that I was watching. And much to our amazement, this snake's lock anemone started doing what we call bilateral um, splitting. And if you look down here, the normal um, cylindrical body it's actually stretched right, right out. And they're capable of actually splitting themselves in half and making two sea anemones. It's quite a complex process because obviously, if you've only got one mouth and one stomach, somehow that's got to be divided between the two um, sea anemones that are produced. But it is quite a fascinating process and it's certainly stretched itself very, very thin there. This is what I really love about wildlife. We were walking along Ramsey Beach recently and we had some spring tides. So that means the water goes out a lot, lot further at low, um, low tide. And we came across this little hermit crab here. Now, when we picked it up, we realized it was really quite a squishy covered shell and it was covered in spots as well. It didn't look normal. And can you see that funny little gray bit that we're just touching there? That was actually the shell you could see it was a normal shell like you would expect a hermit crab to be in. Now, we put it down because we were, we were going to move it to safety and take it away from the girls. But when we place it back down on the ground there, can you see those pink sort of blisters coming? And they just suddenly appeared all over the um, body of the crab. The, uh, and when we touched them, can you see they were sort of like a stringy jelly? It turns out this crab shell was covered by something called a cloak anemone and that was actually like the stinging cells and that gel has got like toxins in and there you can see that shell again. Now that shell is really quite small for the size of the crab and what this cloak anemone does is actually extend the shell. It'd be a bit of a problem if um, it stayed with that crab all the time and the crab um, got rid of its shell. Absolutely amazing little anemone um, and I've never seen it before.